please pause the video and try this problem. I hope you really did try this problem on paper. Uh, you'll benefit much more from these videos if you try the problems first before watching um, the solution. Now let's go through the solution together. Let's start by numbering the carbons, including this one. I'm not going to bother to number this carbon because this turns out to be a solvent that won't participate directly in the reaction. Now remember that in the previous video, we saw that the most important factor in organic chemistry is formal charges. So we need to start by asking if there are any formal charges in these starting materials. And the way you find formal charges is by looking for ionic bonds. If there are any ionic bonds, those will have a formal charge. And in fact, we should see that we do have an ionic bond here between the sodium and the oxygen. Sodium is a metal and oxygen is a nonmetal. A bond between a metal and a nonmetal is usually ionic. Sodium is a metal from the left of the periodic table. Oxygen is a nonmetal from the right of the periodic table. And remember that elements that are further to the right want electrons more, and elements that are further to the left want electrons less. Since the oxygen wants electrons more, we can think of it as taking electrons away from the sodium and ending up with a negative formal charge. Since the sodium wants electrons less, we can think of it as giving up electrons to the oxygen and ending up with a positive formal charge. An ionic bond is an attraction between a positive formal charge and a negative formal charge. That's why you can use ionic bonds to discover um, formal charges that might not have been drawn for you in the starting materials. On the other hand, all of the remaining bonds in the other starting materials are between nonmetals and other nonmetals. So all the remaining bonds in the starting materials are covalent. So there's no reason to think that there are any extra formal charges anywhere else in the starting materials. Usually the only formal charges that you have to draw into the starting materials are formal charges for ionic bonds. I went into more detail about how to discover um, and use ionic bonds in the SN2 series. This is very important material because we use the ionic bond to find the formal charges and the formal charges are the most important factor in organic chemistry. Now we should start predicting the roles that we expect various atoms to play in the reaction. Which atoms do we expect to participate in this reaction? Well, the atoms that are most likely to participate in the reaction are the atoms with formal charges. So we expect this O- minus to participate in the reaction. What role do we predict for the O-? minus? Well, a negative formal charge makes an atom want to donate electrons to get rid of the negative formal charge. The roles that donate electrons are nucleophiles and bases. So we predict that the oxygen will be either a nucleophile or a base. Um, pretty soon, we'll figure out which one. We expect this oxygen to participate in the reaction. We do not expect this oxygen to participate in the reaction. How can you tell the difference? It's based on the formal charge. Because this oxygen has a negative um, formal charge, it's very um, reactive. A neutral oxy uh, oxygen is less reactive, so we prefer to use this negative oxygen rather than this neutral oxygen. Um, this molecule here is an alcohol and the solvent. So in this reaction, this, molecule, um, this alcohol will play the role of solvent but it won't participate um, uh, more directly in the mechanism. We prefer to use the negative oxygen in the mechanism. Certainly, a negative oxygen will be a better nucleophile and a better base than a neutral oxygen. The formal charges are your most important tool for predicting what roles atoms will play in the reaction. Now, what about the sodium plus? The sodium plus has a positive charge. Does that mean the sodium will participate in the reaction? Well, that's an exception. Atoms with formal charges usually participate in reactions, but metals with a positive formal charge, such as sodium plus or potassium plus, are an exception. A metal with a positive formal charge is usually a spectator ion, which does not participate in the reaction. So we expect that this sodium plus, um, despite its formal charge, will be a spectator ion that will not participate in the reaction. What other roles and labels can we assign 
at this point. We should have memorized that neutral chlorine is a good leaving group. Um, so we assign, uh, expect the neutral chlorine to be our leaving group, and we can recognize now that this starting material is an alkyl halide because it has a halogen attached to an alkyl group. We can label carbon-2 as our alpha carbon because carbon-2 is the carbon attached to the leaving group. Is carbon-2 primary, secondary, or tertiary? Here's the answer. Carbon-2 is a tertiary alpha carbon because it's attached to three carbon chains. Carbon-2 is attached to carbon-1, carbon-4, and carbon-3. Three. three carbon chains. Notice that um, a methyl group still counts as a carbon chain. Notice that for this definition, we're not counting the total number of bonds to carbon-2. We're only counting the number of attached carbon chains. Write down that we have a tertiary alpha carbon. Now we choose a mechanism. How do we do that? Well, we've seen that for an alkyl halide, we use a table to determine the mechanism. Here's our table. We know that this table works for alkyl halides. Which row of the table do we use? We have a tertiary alpha carbon, so we use the bottom row of the table because the bottom row is the row for a tertiary alpha carbon. Which column of the table do we use? Well, our nucleophile or base is O minus. So we're going to use the right-hand column of the table because the right-hand column of the table is the column for O minus. So then the table predicts an E2 mechanism. Write down the name of the mechanism. Notice how important it was that we found the ionic bond and put in the formal charges. If we hadn't realized that this was an ionic bond, and if we hadn't drawn in the formal charges, it would have seemed like we were dealing with a neutral oxygen. If we don't draw in the formal charges, this looks like a neutral oxygen. But neutral oxygen is in a completely different column of the table, and neutral oxygen would predict completely different mechanisms. Make sure that you identify the ionic bonds so that you can find the formal charges, because the most important factor in organic chemistry is the formal charges because formal charges are one of your most important tools for figuring out what will happen in a reaction. Now that we know that the mechanism will be E2, we know that we're not going to use a nucleophile, we're going to use a base. So we can label that the O- will act as a base. An E2 mechanism uses a base, not a nucleophile. And again, our table tells us that O- is a strong base. I will label the O minus SB for strong base. By the way, we've seen that we use this table to determine the mechanism for alkyl halides. That means that you need to memorize this table, doesn't it? Um, unless your exams are open notes, you're going to need to memorize this table if you want to use it on exams. And that is what I recommend. I recommend that you memorize this table and use it to determine the mechanism for alkyl halides, uh, and later we'll see how it applies to alkyl sulfonates on exams. Remember that for E2, we should label the alpha and beta carbons. We've already labeled our alpha carbon. Now let's label the beta carbons. So this molecule has three beta carbons, carbon-1, carbon-4, and carbon-3. Um, so which of those beta carbons should we use in our mechanism? Well, the problem says to draw the product or products. So if necessary, we would have to use all three beta carbons if necessary to get three different products. On the other hand, if these beta carbons give you the same product, we only have to use one of them. Well, is it clear to you that each of these beta carbons is going to result in the same E2 product? So we only have to use one of them. Um, one way we can see that is that all of these beta carbons have the same connectivity. Connectivity is a technical term. Connectivity is a technical term. Um, the connectivity of an atom in a molecule depends on the complete series of all the atoms that the atom is connected to and all the atoms that those atoms are connected to, etc., for the entire length of the molecule. Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that each of these beta carbons has the same connectivity. For example, what's the connectivity of carbon-1? Carbon-1 is connected to three hydrogens and the alpha carbon. What's the connectivity of carbon-4? 
Carbon-4 is connected to three hydrogens and the alpha carbon. What's the connectivity of carbon-3? Carbon-3 is connected to three hydrogens and the alpha carbon. So each of these does have the same connectivity. And because they have the same connectivity, we can trust that they will result in the same E2 product. There is a, uh, a, a, an exception to that rule. If um, the E2 product has a stereo center, then beta carbons with the same connectivity might still result in different E2 products, but we don't have to worry that, about that here. I think it's pretty plain um, that this molecule has no stereo centers and the product will have no stereo centers. So we can trust that since all of the beta carbons have the same connectivity, we can trust that they will all result in the same E2 product. And that means there's only going to be one E2 product in this case. Even though there's three different beta carbons, each of those three beta carbons would result in the same E2 product. So we only have to draw the mechanism once. Which beta carbon should you use? It doesn't matter. You can use whichever of these three beta carbons you like. Uh, because we've seen that they're all going to result in the same E2 product. Um, let's say that we'll use carbon-1. Since I'm planning to use carbon-1 as the beta carbon for the E2 mechanism, I will erase the beta labels for carbon-4 and carbon-3. We'll, we will use carbon-1 as our beta carbon in our E2 mechanism. Now we can finish assigning roles for our mechanism. We know that O- will act as our um, base, and we know that a base needs to react with an acid. Um, the acid is the um, atom that gives away a proton, and we expect um, the base to take the uh, hydrogen from the beta carbon, so we're going to use this beta carbon as our acid. I'll label carbon-1 WA for weak acid. Because it's weak, it's not very reactive but we're using a strong base, which is very reactive. So an acid-base reaction is reasonable between a strong base um, and a weak acid. Now we draw the electron pushing arrows. First, we start with this idea. We need an arrow to show the base taking the beta hydrogen. So you need to draw in the beta hydrogen. That includes drawing in the bond to the beta hydrogen. Here's our arrow that shows the base taking the beta hydrogen. Remember that the base is supposed to donate electrons. So the base goes at the tail, at the beginning of the electron pushing arrow to show that it's donating electrons. And the base is donating electrons to take a proton, um, to take this beta hydrogen. So at the head of this arrow, we put the hydrogen that's being taken. Next, we need the electron pushing arrow to show the pi bond forming between alpha and beta carbons. Well, when the hydrogen forms a new bond to the oxygen, that will free up the electrons in this bond, so we can move those electrons over here to form the pi bond between the alpha and the beta carbons. This arrow would be wrong. The head of the arrow should not point directly to the alpha carbon. That doesn't show the formation of a pi bond. The head of the arrow should be between the alpha and the beta carbon to show the formation of the pi bond. So that's the arrow to show the pi bond forming between alpha and beta carbons. Notice that it's much easier, I think, to get these arrows correct if you've labeled your alpha and beta carbons. And then we need an, need an arrow to show the leaving group leaving the alpha carbon. So here's our electron pushing arrow for that. So let's make sure that this arrow is consistent with our formal charges. We've put the negative formal charge at the beginning of the series of arrows. That makes good sense because um, something with a negative formal charge wants to donate electrons. We would never want to put a negative formal charge at the end of the series of arrows. Now we're ready to use these electron pushing arrows to draw the products for this step. Here are our rules for using electron pushing arrows to draw the products of a mechanism step. Every electron pushing arrow tells you to erase a bond, draw a bond, or both. What does this arrow tell us to do? This arrow tells us to draw a new bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Here I've shown um, the oxygen um, with a new bond um, to that hydrogen. Um, make sure that you keep numbering your products consistently with the starting materials. Over here I called this carbon-5. So I should be careful to continue calling that carbon-5 
we'll just make fewer mistakes if we keep numbering all of our carbons consistently. We used this rule. We formed a sigma bond because the arrow head was pointing to an atom which was not already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. That's kind of a complicated rule, but the head of this arrow is pointing to the hydrogen, and the tail of the arrow is pointing to this lone pair. In this picture, the hydrogen is not yet sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. In this picture, the hydrogen now is sharing um, those electrons in this covalent bond. But in this picture, the hydrogen was not yet sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. That's the situation where a arrow tells you to form a sigma bond. I'm going to explain um, this uh, somewhat complicated rule in more detail at the end of this video. Because this oxygen is at the beginning of the chain of arrows, the oxygen is losing electrons. The oxygen started negative and lost electrons, so the oxygen becomes one step less negative. So we need to change the charge on this oxygen from negative to neutral. Always make the atom that loses electrons at the start of the chain of arrows one step less negative. Now, what about this sodium plus? What should we do with that? Should we continue to draw the sodium plus like this? Should we continue to draw the sodium plus close to the oxygen? Well, in the starting materials, the sodium plus was being drawn close to the oxygen because of the ionic bond, because of the attraction between the positive and the negative formal charges. But remember that in the product, the oxygen has lost its formal charge. Since this oxygen has lost its formal charge, um, it no longer can form an ionic bond with the sodium. An ionic bond is an attraction between a positive and a negative formal charge. Once the oxygen has lost its negative formal charge, it no longer has any attraction for this positive sodium. So no, it does not make sense to draw this sodium close to the oxygen in the products. And in fact, the best thing to do with this sodium is just leave it out of the products completely. Since the sodium is not participating in the reaction, since the sodium is just an unreactive spectator ion in this reaction, there's no need to write the sodium in the products at all. The best way to handle an unreactive spectator ion, like the sodium plus, is just leave it out of the products completely. Now we can work with this arrow. This arrow tells us both to break a bond and to form a bond. The tail of this arrow is on the bond between the hydrogen and carbon-1, so it tells us to break the bond between um, the hydrogen and carbon-1. We already kind of did that when we moved the hydrogen over here. The head of this arrow is on the bond between um, carbon-1 and carbon-2. Um, and that's the situation when an arrowhead is pointing to a bond. That's the situation where the um, arrow tells you to form a pi bond. We need to form a pi bond between carbon-1 and carbon-2. So here I've formed a new pi bond between um, carbon-1 and carbon-2. This arrow has its tail on the bond between carbon-2 and the chlorine, so this arrow tells us to break the bond between carbon-2 and the chlorine. We broke the bond between carbon-2 and the chlorine. The chlorine is at the end of the series of arrows, so the chlorine is gaining electrons. The chlorine starts neutral and gains electrons, so the chlorine changes from neutral to negative. Always make the atom that gains electrons at the end of the chain of arrows one step more negative. Don't change the formal charge for any atom in the middle of the series um, of arrows. You only change the formal charge um, at the beginning of the series of arrows, that was the oxygen here, and at the end of the um, series of arrows, that was the chlorine here. What type of functional group is this product? Remember that this is called an alkene because it has a carbon-carbon double bond. Now, this is actually not a good way to draw an alkene. An alkene is supposed to have trigonal planar geometry, and the bond angle for trigonal planar geometry should be three equal angles of 120 degrees. Well, it certainly doesn't seem like this angle and this angle and this angle. Those don't look like three equal 120 degree angles, so let's fix that. Here's a better way to draw the alkene. Um, in this new picture, um, we're much closer to having three equal bond angles here of 120 degrees each.
Whenever you redraw a molecule, it's easy to make mistakes. So make sure that you number both of these pictures consistently with each other. The numbers will help you to avoid making mistakes when you redraw the alkene to get more accurate geometry. So again, we see that the product of an E2 reaction is an alkene, and a common starting material for an E2 reaction is an alkyl halide. We followed these E2 guidelines. Label the alpha and the beta carbons, as we did here. We made sure that the beta carbon we were using was attached to a hydrogen, and we used this rule. There were three beta carbons, um, but we knew that they would each um, give us the same E2 product because all the beta carbons had the same connectivity. Now, if you like, you can confirm that by actually drawing the products you would get from using the other two beta carbons. Here is the product that you would get if you had used carbon-4 as the beta carbon. Here is the product you might get if you used carbon-3 as the beta carbon. I hope that you'll agree that these are all three different pictures of the same molecule. You can see that because you could rotate each of these pictures to look like the other two. For example, if you rotated this picture 120 degrees like so, it would look the same as this picture. If you rotated this picture 120 degrees like so, it would look the same as this picture. So these really are three different pictures of the same alkene. So you could have, you could have written your final answer like any of these three, but you should only include one of these. Um, many professors will take off points if you include redundant products. So if you included this answer and this answer and this answer, most professors would take off points because that would be including redundant products. Um, we should only include one of these three pictures so that we're not including any redundant products in our answer. Here's a checklist of things that are useful to do for every mechanism. Uh, number all the carbons in the starting materials and um, products. Sometimes you can make an exception. Um, there wasn't any need to number um, this carbon, but it was a good idea to number this carbon. Try to make sure all your numbers are consistent. Um, this seems like somewhere along the way I lost the number on this carbon. This should be numbered as carbon 5. Are we taking the time to number all the carbons? Well, the reason is that one of the most common student mistakes is accidentally adding or dropping carbons when they draw their products. Um, so to avoid accidentally adding or dropping carbons when you draw your products, um, the best way to avoid that is to number all of your carbons in all of your pictures, being careful to make sure that your numbers are all consistent with each other. I know it might seem like that will slow you down, but I think that you'll find that if you don't take the time to number all your carbons consistently, you will lose points from accidentally adding or dropping carbons. Remember that the numbers that we're talking about right now are numbers that we're going to use for our own personal use, not for naming the molecule. So when you write down these types of numbers, there's no need to follow the official IUPAC naming rules. Just write down any numbers that you like as long as you're consistent in your various pictures. Label which specific atoms will play which roles. We labeled that our O- would be our strong base, carbon-1 would be our weak acid, and the chlorine would be the leaving group. And always identify the clues that tell you which atoms will play which roles. We knew that the oxygen would be the strong base because of its negative formal charge. We knew carbon-1 would be a weak acid because we've memorized that the beta carbon in an alkyl halide is weakly acidic. And we knew that the chlorine would be a leaving group because we've memorized that neutral chlorine is a good leaving group. Always label the alpha carbon, as we did here, and write down whether the alpha carbon is primary, secondary, secondary, or tertiary. You should write this down because this is key information that we're going to use in our table to determine the mechanism. Then um, for this type of reaction involving an alkyl halide, we use the table to determine the mechanism write down, write down the name of the mechanism. That's important because very often I see students tell me that the mechanism is E2 and then they accidentally forget and draw an SN2 mechanism. So to avoid forgetting what mechanism you're trying to draw, make sure that you write down the name of the mechanism as soon as you figure it out. Don't begin drawing the products of a mechanism step until you've finished drawing the electron pushing arrows for that step. So for example, 
First, make sure that you've drawn all three of these arrows. First, make sure that you've drawn all three of these arrows, and only after you've drawn the arrows should you start trying to draw the products. The reason for that is that the electron pushing arrows are your tool for drawing the correct products. If you haven't drawn the electron pushing arrows for the step yet, you really don't have a reliable way of drawing the correct products. Try to use the electron pushing arrows as your tools for drawing the correct products. Don't just take a guess as to what the products will look like, and don't just try to draw products that feel similar to what you've seen in the past. If you try to do that, your professor can trap you by um, giving you a problem that's a little bit different than you've seen in the past. If the professor gives you a problem that's a little bit different and you're just relying on what you've seen in the past, you won't have any way to adapt. Use the electron pushing arrows to figure out the right way to draw the product, and then you'll be able to adapt if the problem is a little bit different to, than what you've seen in the past. The reaction is usually finished when the main product has no formal charge. So here, one clue that we were finished was that our main product here has no formal charge. I know that it might seem that if you try to carry out this checklist for each reaction, that might seem that, like that's going to slow you down quite a bit. Um, but as a beginning OCHEM student, you'll make fewer mistakes and you'll develop your OCHEM mastery much quicker if you try to get into the habit of carrying out these steps. When you're taking your exams, you might find that you don't have time to always carry out every single one of these steps, and um, that's okay, but it will benefit you a lot in your practice at this point if you're making a habit to carry out these steps. And even on your exams, even on your exams, a lot of these steps will be very helpful to help you get the correct answers and avoid mistakes. Even on exams, it's helpful to number all of your carbons. Um, even on exams, it's very important to write down the name of the mechanism that you're carrying out. Students tend to make mistakes um, when uh, they don't follow these steps. The last thing I want to do in this video is explain this rule for when you know to form a new sigma bond from an electron pushing arrow in a little bit more detail. Form a sigma bond when the arrowhead is pointing to an atom which was not already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. That's a little complicated. So let's take a little bit more time to explain that important rule. So this is an arrow. This is an arrow that tells you to form a sigma bond. The head of the arrow is on this hydrogen, and the tail is on um, this lone pair. And in this picture, the hydrogen is not yet sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. In this picture, the lone pair has become a covalent bond, and now in this picture, the hydrogen is sharing the electrons in the covalent bond. But in this picture, the hydrogen is not yet sharing the electrons um, in the lone pair at the tail of this arrow. So this is the situation where you should form a sigma bond, because the arrowhead is pointing to an atom which was not already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. Now I think that will be clearer if we compare this arrow with this arrow. Now this arrow does not tell you to form a sigma bond. Why not? Well, at the head of this arrow, we have the chlorine. And at the tail of this arrow, we have the electrons in this covalent bond. Now do you see, already, already in this picture, the chlorine is already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. In this picture, the chlorine is already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow um, because the, uh, the, the electrons are in a covalent bond um, that the chlorine is sharing. When the arrowhead is pointing to an atom which is already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow, do not form a bond. This arrowhead is pointing to the chlorine which is already in this picture sharing the electrons at the tail in a covalent bond. So this arrow did not tell us to form a new bond. On the other hand, when the arrowhead is pointing to an atom which was not already sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow, that's when you should form a new sigma bond. The head of this arrow is pointing to the hydrogen, and in this picture, the hydrogen is not yet sharing the electrons at the tail of the arrow. So this is an arrow that does tell us to form a new sigma bond.
Okay, I hope that helps to clarify this somewhat um, complicated rule. I know that's a little bit subtle, but you're going to be using electron pushing arrows over and over and over and over for the entire rest of your course, and um, you'll benefit a lot if you have a clear idea of um, what the rules for using electron pushing arrows are. Also, just keep in mind that every arrow tells you to erase a bond or to draw a new bond or both. And sometimes that might be enough um, to, to allow you to figure out what to do with an arrow. Um, I think that um, it's pretty intuitive that um, this is an arrow that tells us to form a new bond. Um, and that this is an arrow that tells us to break a bond. And that this is an arrow that tells us both to break a bond and to form a bond. So notice that this mechanism gives you an example of all three possibilities. Any electron pushing arrow tells you to erase a bond, draw a new bond, or both. Again, this electron pushing arrow told us to draw a new bond. This electron pushing arrow told us to erase a bond. And this electron pushing arrow told us to do both, both to erase a bond and to um, form a new bond. The electron pushing arrows are your tools for drawing the correct products, uh, but that will only work for you if you're familiar with these rules for using the electron pushing arrows. In the next video in this series, we will practice another problem that involves an E2 mechanism. Did you find this video to be helpful? If so, you can support the videos by using the PayPal donate button on my website to make either a one-time donation or a monthly pledge. You can visit my website by clicking the link on the screen or by using the link in the video description box. Thank you.